Good morning. I'm John Fry, pastor of worship ministry, and it's uh, my joy to be able to welcome you to Calvary Church today. We're in the middle of our summer series called Honest to God, which is a study in the book of the Psalms. And today, our topic is going to be guilt and forgiveness. It's impossible to go through life without feeling guilty about something. But there's great joy and happiness that comes inside when we realize that we're forgiven. And so as we begin, here's some words from Psalm 32 that will really help us to concentrate and to look into this, uh, the music that we're getting ready to sing in just a few moments. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, you that are upright in heart. And we want to do just that. We want to shout for joy. We want to sing joyfully to the Lord. Would you stand? Let's lift our voices. Love. 
lavished over us, his daughters and his sons. Made alive, made alive, now we're free, rescued and redeemed, the victory is won. Who is like you, none compared, there's no one like our God. Bring greatly to be praised.
Greetings in Christ's name to each and every one of you here in the auditorium, listening on WDAC, perhaps uh, over the internet. My name is Brad Mullen. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, I hope you've been getting into the festivities of uh, the weekend. Happy birthday. Happy uh, 239th birthday of the United States. And maybe it's because of those celebrations that you're here at Calvary Church today. You're with family, you're with friends, uh, you're vacationing, and you chose to come to Calvary Church to worship. Uh, you're our guests. We're so delighted that you're here. Uh, we're not going to stop the service and have a greeting time, but we'd love to greet you and thank you personally. And there's a way we do it here, and that is 10 minutes after every service, over in a room, lobby, to my right, your left, by the east entrance. Uh, Pastor Bo and other staff people are there to greet you. And uh, you have any questions? Uh, happy to answer them. Uh, we're not a club. We're not looking for subscribers. We're a church. We're here to serve you. And if there's any way we can serve you, uh, please let us know. Well, uh, our fiscal year has ended. And ushers, by the way, you can come forward and uh, take this morning's offering. Uh, half of 2015 is gone. We have another half to go, but our fiscal year has ended, and I'm happy to report that the financial health of Calvary Church is strong, and it's strong because of the Lord's faithfulness and your generosity. We also want to thank you for being so responsive. The last few weeks we've said a few things about uh, we need a little over here and over there in our designated giving, and you responded so very nicely, so thank you. You'll always find uh, in the bulletin a report on uh, where we are financially up to that week, and then a little note at the bottom. We call it, did you know? It might tell you something about uh, giving and uh, something about what's happening uh, at Calvary Church financially. So always take a look at that. Now, this week is a special weekend, but next weekend, wow, I don't know what to expect. It's the Women's U.S. Open weekend. Uh, and uh, not a weekend, it's really the entire next week. And uh, by the way, do you know why they call it an open? It's because it's really open to everyone who qualifies. Uh, and uh, that doesn't include virtually anybody here, I'm sure. Uh, very, the very best uh, players uh, are here. And uh, we don't know, maybe a few of them will wander into Calvary Church. We're going to be a parking venue. We're very happy to cooperate. But that means next Sunday we're going to have a shift in time. We're going to be moving things earlier, beginning at 8 o'clock. This, this, we're going to have an 8 o'clock worship service. And I hope some of you will consider being here. Uh, some of you tell us that you'd like to have an 8 o'clock service. Well, here's your opportunity. So uh, we don't want to just have a few people here in the service at 8. So if you'd want to come to the 8 o'clock service, we'd appreciate it. And just come if you want to see who else uh, would come and get up at 8 o'clock uh, and come, come to Calvary Church. Um, so that's next weekend. 8, 9.30, Sunday morning, not 11 o'clock. Okay, not this hour. If you come at this hour, you can have a private time of meditation, uh, but there'll be no service. Okay. Uh, July 4th, it's a time for family and, and uh, outdoor activities, cookouts, that type of thing. And traditionally, it's also been a time for prayer, uh, national prayer. And that's something that's diminishing a bit in our public life, sadly. But we can pray. So I'd invite us now all to gather together and pray for the United States of America. Let's pray. Father, you have declared, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. The first sentence of the declaration recognizes our creator. Our currency states, in God we trust. We pledge allegiance to one nation under God. And our anthem says that we're the land of the free. That freedom that we so highly prize, Lord, we celebrate not as an achievement, but as a blessing from you. Father, we know the words, but do we know the way? 
we ask for your guiding hand to strengthen these founding principles of the United States in changing and complicated times. Use the United States for good in this world. However, it's to you that we look, not to any government, to bring universal righteousness and peace, and that only when Jesus returns. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Teach us to interpret the news through the lens of your love, your wisdom, and your sovereign power. Your children scattered throughout the U.S. need your discernment, not to confuse our national citizenship, which is temporal and earthly, with our spiritual citizenship, eternal, heavenly, and universal, crossing every geographical boundary. So give to our global partners all that they need to minister cross-culturally and continue to unite your church worldwide. May the lost come to know you through our godliness and our love for one another. So superintend the rise and fall of nations, war and peace, poverty and prosperity, to achieve your greatest goal of all, to make the gospel of Jesus Christ known throughout the whole world. Remembering your command that we pray for all those in authority, we ask you to grant compassion and wisdom to President Obama and all who serve in our executive branch. Also for the 535 legislators of the Senate and House of Representatives, including Pennsylvania Senators Casey and Toomey, Representative Pitts, and for Governor Wolf and state and local officials, use them all. The nine justices of the Supreme Court, judges throughout the land, Use them to lead us in justice and righteousness and peace. So, gracious Father, on this, the birthday of national independence, we thank you for the United States while we confess our dependence upon you and you alone. To you we offer praise, and from you we receive grace through Jesus Christ for our every need. Accept our worship. It comes willingly from loving and grateful hearts and in Jesus' name, amen. You know, Pastor Bo, in reflecting on this prayer and uh, our present situation, I thought to myself, how great a time to have a series like Honest to God, because there's a lot of stuff going on. Just recently, you know, the Supreme Court decision about uh, just a further weakening again of this concept of marriage. Uh, that's one of the things going on. There are many yeah, others. Yeah, I think of, you know, what happened in Charleston and, and just in general, the, 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 the atmosphere in our country, you know, related to racism is just yeah. as, uh, you know. Yeah, we've had terror warnings. You know, I've, are people afraid to gather because uh, something bad might happen? And, and I think of what's happened even in our own church family. Calvary's yeah. a large church. People have lost loved ones and you know, just, just challenging and, and, and difficult times, and, and the list could go on and on. And challenging emotions, and then I think sometimes changing and conflicting emotions. Yeah. There's a swirl. How, how would, do we feel, or how should we feel about these things? Well, and that's why, as you said, this series is so appropriate, talking about being honest to God, and, and people are wondering and thinking, and I think the fact that we know that we can be honest to God um, you know, is, is, is part of what we, what we need. And the way these psalms both help us to express it and then to shape the way yeah. we, we are to think about it. It's not just that we give it to God and let Him take care of it, but He is changing us. And I know yeah. today is, a, is just a great psalm. I can't wait to… I was in the first service, and I'm going to be in this service because it is, it is absolutely fantastic what the news is from Psalm 32. Do you want to do it together? Because this is working pretty well, this banter back and forth. No? You prepared. Right. I didn't. It's <clears throat> good. Uh, as Brad said, my name is Bo Eckert. Uh, I'm the senior pastor here at Calvary Church. And just quickly, as we just, you know, talking a little bit about current events, We've, we do that on a regular basis, you know, on the staff. And uh, I began just this week because I didn't want to 
react too quickly as, as some did and started to write my thoughts down about what's going on in the Supreme Court decision and all of those things. And, and so I started to make a, a list and some, some items. I'm going to bring it before the elders this month and, and bring it before all of you over these next uh, weeks and months. And, but, but the first two things that I wrote at the top of that, the first one was, let's not panic. Um, Jesus is not in the grave And there's no court in this land or any other land that can pass a law that puts him back in the grave. So let's not forget that. And let's also not forget that the gospel, the the, the good news of the message of Jesus Christ is what changes lives. And um, there's lots of tactics and techniques that people want to take in this country and elsewhere to try to, you know, bring about change. But we believe that ultimately the gospel is what changes lives. That's why we will continually preach the gospel and the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. So those are you know, some initial thoughts and, and, and more thoughts to come uh, on that. But, um, but today, if you would, um, I, I want to invite you to open with me to Psalm 32. It's found on page 462 as we continue in this Honest to God series here at Calvary Church. And today, we're going to talk about guilt and the feelings of guilt and what to do when we say, I feel guilty. Um, Have you felt guilty recently? I was thinking about my own life, and I reflected um, about some things from, from my past. And I remember when I was in high school, I was playing pond hockey locally with some friends from high school. And the fellow whose home we were at, his 10-year-old sister was playing, and she was in the corner going for the puck, and I said, that's my puck. And so she got body checked by me, and she fell and broke her wrist. You talk about feeling guilty, but I ended up with the puck, and you know, so, no. It's not justified, it's not justified. I've told the story here before, of when I was on the mission field in Africa, kind of showing off the right arm and took a piece of fruit and threw it through a kitchen window and the glass shattered all in the bowl of mashed potatoes that was being prepared for dinner that night. Um, so that was, that was some guilt there. I've also talked to the story, told the story about how I locked our two-year-old daughter in the basement closet And before you call child services on me, we eventually got her out. She eventually started talking again. Um, So I think that she's, I think that she's doing okay. But, you know, there's things like that that you kind of chuckle at that, you know, brings guilt into our lives. But, and you might have some of those stories as well. But when you come down to it, isn't there real things in our life that are hurtful and there's pain? And when you think about the guilt associated with that, you say, I've been living with guilt for years. I've been living with guilt for 20, 30, 40 years, and it's just there, and it just nags at me. And sometimes, isn't it true that we as Christians feel like, I don't know what to do with that, because we kind of feel like we've got to put on a good image and, and, and kind of keep things together uh, on the outside, and we're just not sure what to do with it. Well, David um, helps us to know what we can do with that guilt. Um, so I've broken this passage down into two main sections, and the first section we just call the guilt of sin forgiven. And what does it look like to have our sin forgiven? And David is going to help us to see that. And he begins in verse 1 with kind of a summary statement, a summary statement of the forgiveness that he experienced. And as we want to be able to look to God's word for our worldview, let's see the worldview that we get from Scripture, a biblical worldview about how to deal with guilt and sin. Let's jump in here together. Verse 1. Blessed is the one Satisfied, content, fulfilled, happy in the Lord is the one who what? Who is without sin? Is the one who covers over and hides their sin so that nobody sees it? Is the one who keeps up the external appearances so that people will think highly of us? Is that what David said is the blessed one in the blessed life. No, he said, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, 
whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Just look in those two verses of the words that I've underlined up here on the screen. David's worldview is that sin is a problem for all of us. The blessed person realizes the reality of sin. They realize that sin is hardwired in us. It's part of our nature. Sin wants to come and to be our master. It's something that has been inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. And the outworking of the sin problem that we have, the manifestation of that sin problem are the sins that we commit. And one of the ways that we can define those sins that we commit is everything that we think, say, and do that does not please God, that does not line up with the character of God. And isn't it true that as Christians, we sometimes forget that God has forgiven our sin? Isn't it true that sometimes the longer we walk with God... Sometimes the easier it is to forget about our sin and to forget about what he has forgiven us of and to forget about what he needs to forgive us of on a daily basis. And we see other people and we see the world around us. And isn't it so easy to point fingers and to condemn and to be judgmental? But David said, blessed is the person whose sin is forgiven, whose sin is covered over by God. This is the reality. This is his worldview. This is his summary statement. Sin was real in his life. Sin is real in my life and in your life. And we do different things with it. But he says, no, we need to come and to confess it so God forgives it. So that God is the one that is covering over our sin. And there at the end of the verse verse 2, it says, in whose spirit there is no deceit, which could be just another synonym for sin, but I think there's more to it than that. We deceive ourselves and we deceive God when we say, our sin is real, but when we're not repulsed by our sin, when we don't grieve over our sin. Parents, haven't you had the opportunity when your child does something wrong and they need to apologize to someone and they do it very begrudgingly? And you know that they're just kind of mouthing the words, but they don't really mean that they're sorry. And it's easy for me to pick on kids, but isn't it true of all of us? And we dance around the sins that we commit and we make excuses and we rationalize. But we deceive ourselves and we deceive God when we don't see the gravity of our sin. And we don't see the way it impacts our life and the lives of other people. And when we don't see how it affects our relationship with God. And what we often do, instead of confessing our sin, we blame shift. Well, they made me do it. My environment, my culture that I live in made me do it. Or we rationalize it. Well, it's really not that big of a deal. I know that I did this, but have you seen this person's life? And we feel better about ourselves when we can have somebody worse than us that we can compare ourselves to. Or many times we recognize the sin and the guilt that's in our lives and we just go through an immen- a tremendous amount of to cover it over and to hide it. Or we find ways to escape that guilt. Or we try to be good in other areas of our life, thinking that it's going to make up for what we don't want anybody to see over here. But the one thing I love about this psalm is David's reflecting on his own life experience. And you see, for those that are following in the outline, I have that word experiencing over and over and over again because he's not just telling us what to do, he's telling us what he has experienced. So when we get to verse 3, we see the way that he experienced guilt in his life. Look at the way he describes the guilt that was there when he didn't confess his sin. Can you relate to this? 
For when I kept silent, when I hid, when I masked it, when I kind of just stuffed it, he says, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Isn't it a good thing that we do feel guilt? Isn't it a good thing that we feel conviction? Because we know that there's something that's just not right and something that needs to be dealt with. He says, my strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. We know what oppressive heat can feel like. And he compares that to when, when he covers and is silent about his sin, the guilt that's there that just eats and eats away. That was his experience of guilt. But now in verse 5, we see his experience of confession. And notice the words that are underlined. I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. Notice this for those that really like to dig in and study the Bible. Verse 5, you see the word cover, but you also saw the word cover in verse 1. But notice the contrast and the difference. There's a big difference when we try to cover and hide our own sin. We don't want anybody to see it. We want to cover over it. But the reality is when we don't cover our sin and we come and confess our sin, then that allows God to cover it for us. To blot it out. To cast it away. To put it behind his back. There's a difference between God covering our sin and us attempting to cover our own sin. I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So I thought about this idea of confession. And I said, why do we confess? If God sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay for my sin, why do I confess my sin? Why do I repent of my sin? Why doesn't he just wash it away? And then I go and sin some more so he can wash it away again. Some Christians live with this mentality of we go throughout the week and we fill up our bucket of sin. And then we come to church and God wipes it away and empties that bucket. Why? So that we can just go fill it back up again. And that's kind of the cycle of their life. But God says, no, I'm not just interested in, in blotting out your sin and wiping away your sin just so you can go and sin some more. Here's why confession and repentance should be a normal part of the Christian life. It's because God is interested in a relationship with us. He's not just interested in wiping out our sins so we can go and sin again. What sin ultimately does is breaks that relationship with God. So God wants us to be grieved over our sin. And he wants us to come and to confess and repent our sin. When's the last time you came and you confessed and you repented of your sin to God? Don't we spend most of our time in prayer just asking God for things? Is our heart ever grieved because we damage our relationship with God because of the sin in our life? Another reason why we, 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 we confess and repent our sin is because God is not just, as I said, wiping out our sins so we can go and sin some more. He is trying to change sinners. He is trying to help sinners to become more like Christ. He is trying to transform our lives to be like Christ. Because he knows the destructive nature and the power of sin. He knows what sin does to us and in us, to our relationships. And he says, no, I don't want to just forgive you so that you can go and do the same thing all over again. I want to change you. I want you to become more like Jesus. I want you to have an abundant life in the here and now. I don't want you to continue the destructive patterns that you've established. We've said this before. We will continue to say it over and over and over again. Students, you've heard this over again, and we will continue to say it to you over again. Sin overpromises and it underdelivers. Sin always overpromises and underdelivers. 
when we're there and we're in the midst of temptation, sin says to us, it's going to feel really good. And that feeling's going to last. It's okay to do this. It always overpromises and under delivers. It's destructive. We sin. We experience guilt. David says we come and we confess and God forgives us. I confess. He forgives. The relationship is restored and we continue to walk with God in that relationship. That's what David experienced and that should be what the Christian life is like. Martin Luther, when he nailed the thesis to the door, the very first point was this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. I think that's true. It's not just a prayer that we pray, then we go fill up our sin bucket. No, we live in daily repentance, understanding the impact of our sin and that grieves God and, and is destructive in our lives and we come and we repent and God changes us and forgives us and nurtures us along as we become more and more like him. So as we move into the second part of this psalm, David's now gonna say to us, here's what life looks like. Here's what the forgiven life looks like. Here's what the godly life looks like. Here's what it looks like to walk with God each and every day. Here's what it looks like to have the way of sin forsaken in our lives. Starting in verse 6, he says this. He says, therefore, let everyone who is godly. Who is godly? The one who is without sin? No, the one who is godly is the one that did what David described in verses 1 through 5. The one that recognizes their sin and comes and confesses and repents their sin and then God forgives their sin. So the godly one is the one who understands that. So what should they do? They offer prayer to you at the time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach him. Does this mean that God is unreachable? That God is playing hide and seek with us? No, here's what I think it means. I think it means that we establish this ongoing relationship with God. This daily interaction and prayer life with him. So that he's a part of our life. Because if we only wait until the flood of temptation and the waves of sin and the deceit that comes from sin in our life, if we only wait till then to cry out to God, it's very difficult to cry out to God when we're in the midst of it. Don't wait for the waves of temptation, the rush of the waters of sin to come. But come and seek and offer that prayer to him. And here's what life looks like walking with God. Notice the way that in the poetic language, David just piles up word after word to help us to understand this. Look at what he experiences in verse 7. He says, you are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Whether it's in our life or whether it's when the temptation comes, whether when we're in the midst of the difficulty, God is the one that's the hiding place. God is the one that, that, that preserves and surrounds and delivers us. And David says, I've experienced that. I know what that is like. But it doesn't end there. We don't just look to God for our protection, but we look to God for our guidance. Look at the words that he piles up in verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Protection, guidance from God. And as I thought about him using these words and this language and his experience with God, it actually took my mind from Psalm 32 to Psalm 23, which we're going to look at next week in great detail. But isn't it interesting when David thinks about God protecting him and guiding him, I think that's when he can come and say, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, guides me, protects me. He's with me. This was David's experience. And I think that David would say, when I live my life, I want to be sheep-like. I want to be more like a sheep so that God is my shepherd leading and guiding and forgiving and directing. 
And it stands in direct contrast to to the illustration that he gives us here in verse 9. He picks a different farm animal. He says, do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with a bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Do you know what it's like to try to deal with a stubborn horse or mule? Some of you have experienced it. And I think David is saying, when I kept silent in verse 3, when I didn't come and confess, when I tried to cover my own sin, verses 3 and 4, I was very horse-like or mule-like. My feet were dug in. And I was saying, I can handle my life. I can handle the consequences of my own sin. I can handle the, handle the guilt that comes with it. Instead of being sheep-like, David said, I was mule-like or horse-like. And he said, don't be that way. Don't dig in your heels. Don't cover and bury the guilt and the sin and the shame. But come and do what David describes and confess it. Come to God and, and find that forgiveness. I think that's why he uses that illustration of the horse and the, the mule there in verse 9. Because the guilt eats away at us. And he tells us what he experienced. And so as you think about your own life, do you experience guilt over something that you've done, over something that's happened to you. And some of you, you sit there and you're skeptical because you say, I I hear you. I I feel like a little bit is preacher talk. I feel like I can read David's experience, but I don't know if I can relate to it. So to help us dig into this this morning, I want you to hear a story. I want you to hear the story of someone who knows what it's like to feel guilt and to feel shame and to hear the story of what she did with that guilt and shame to help us to know and can relate so that we can experience the same thing. Turn with me now. Let's look at the screens and hear this story. My name's Sue Charles. I'm an artist. It took me years to be able to say that I'm an artist. I used to say, I do art. I teach art and I paint and draw all the time. And I really want to glorify God with the gift he gave me. I think that's one of my biggest um, goals. I have a story to tell is a story of redemption and forgiveness and it's taken a long time to be ready to tell it but I think I'm ready now. I grew up Catholic outside of Philadelphia and I never read the Bible. I never even saw a Bible, and um, I didn't really understand. I mean, I knew Jesus was the Son of God and that he died on the cross, but I had no clue what dying on the cross had to do with me. I went to college and became a teacher and got into a serious relationship in my early 20s. and. Um, That was back in the 70s, and I followed the crowd, and I became pregnant. I don't think I had real great self-confidence, and I kind of just went along with what everyone else was doing. But I thought deep down inside, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person, and that was what I needed to be. I didn't... I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know who He was. I didn't know what He wanted me to do in my life. I didn't know what He wanted from us. Um, I didn't know anything about being obedient to Him. 
So when I told the fella that I was pregnant, he just, just said, I'm not going to ruin my life and marry you, and you need to get an abortion. It was the last thing I wanted to do, and I was really stunned that I was in this position, but and panicked, and um, I had a good job. My parents didn't know, and but I went ahead and did the, what I was pressured into doing. Right away, felt an emptiness and. Uh, guilt, lots of guilt. I just kind of stuffed it and I, I went on with my life. Ended up getting married and uh, having four children. During that time, I started going to another church for the first time opened the Bible and I was 36 years old. My third child had been born and I was stunned. I just, I had no idea there was a book like this. I just um, kind of bathed in the Bible for a long time. It just amazed me that everything I needed for life was in that Bible. As I came to know the Lord, as I heard His Word, I spoke His Word, um, I read his word all the time. I started realizing what I had done. And even though it was legal then, um, it wasn't right. And I think I really, I know I really grieved the Lord. I raised the kids, I worked for my husband, and, but I, I had this inside hidden like my heart was inside a box hidden inside me and that I couldn't really be who I really was meant to be. I had this deep dark secret inside and I didn't realize at the time how much it was eating away at me. But I, something I think about now, I make pizza on the grill and I make my own pizza dough and sometimes I have some left over. So, I wrap it up in saran wrap and I put it in the fridge and the next day sometimes I take out that ball of dough and it's popped through the saran wrap and it's kind of oozed into the refrigerator and it really made me think when I saw that one day about how that's the way this guilt that I was carrying around was oozing into different parts of my life and I didn't realize it but it was affecting my marriage, it was affecting my relationships it was affecting how everything I did and what I thought of myself and, and how I viewed myself in God's eyes. I had said before growing up, I just really did not get what Jesus dying on the cross had to do with me. And over these years, I, I remember laying in bed one night and just going, oh my goodness, that's it. He died for me because he knew that I was capable of doing this and he loves me anyway. And if it hadn't been for his death, if it hadn't been for him rising from the dead and him having new life, I wouldn't have new life either. And I finally got it after all these years, 40 years it took me, but I get it now. No matter how low we go, we can come to Him and ask for forgiveness, and He'll grant it. And not only that, but He'll give us life abundant. This morning when I woke up, it just right into my head, He said, this isn't a story about abortion, it's a story about how much I love you. I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but He lives in me. And that's made all the difference in the world. And I'm seeing life, I'm seeing the world through Christ's eyes, I think, and it looks way different than it did before. Powerful, 
but I hope you captured what she said there at the end. She said, this isn't a story about my sin. It's a story about Christ's love for me. And as you process this in your own heart and your own mind, your story might be very different than Sue's story. But for some of you, your life has become about your sin. And your life has become about your guilt. And it's what David says at the end of this psalm. In verse 10, he said, Many are the sorrows of the wicked. You're sorrowful because of the sin and the guilt that's there in your life. But look what he says. But steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. And that invitation is there for you today to come and to trust the Lord, maybe for the very first time. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. Did you see the way that Sue has rejoiced in the new life that God has given her? O oh, righteous, who are the righteous ones? The one who are without sin? No, the ones whose sin has been forgiven. And shout for joy, all you upright in heart. She said, I finally realized why Jesus died on the cross. And some of you are sitting here today and you've heard that story. You've heard that message. You've heard that Jesus has died on the cross, but you've never made it personal. You've never brought your sin and your guilt and your shame to him. And you've never confessed it to him. And you've never received his forgiveness. And today might be the day that you need to do just that. But again, you sit there and there's some that you kind of push back and you say, it's just Bible verses and it's just somebody's story on a video and to help the, to drive it home even further, I want you to see and I want you to meet Sue in person. She's here with us today. Sue, will you come and join me up here on the platform, please? <clears throat> we have said that Calvary Church is a safe place, but it's not always going to be a comfortable place. So I take it that your applause is saying to Sue, this is a safe place. And I think for, on behalf of all of us, we want to say to you, thank you for telling your story. I know as you and I talked, this was a challenging thing for you to do. Can you just tell us why you decided after 40 years, why, why was now the time for you to tell your story. Well, first I want to thank you for your kindness in walking me through this. Um, I don't know. I, <clears throat> I kept hearing from God. I just kind of got the sense that he wanted to do something bigger with this. And it's not my story. It's his story. Amen. And I have a real sense of that now. And um, I, th I felt like he kept saying, if you keep it to yourself, we're not going to be able to do anything with it. So um, here I am. Isn't it, isn't it amazing how God wants us to be good stewards of what he's doing in our life? And every single person here I know has been blessed because you've been willing to take that step and to tell what God has done in your life. But one of the things that everybody here needs to know and, and we need to talk a little bit more about is um, there was a support group that helped you through this. It's called Surrender the Secret. Right. Tell us a little bit about that support group and, and the impact that it had on, on your life and your journey. It's an eight-week Bible study for women who have had abortion, and by the way, also for men who are dealing with it too. Um, I was scared to death when I signed up for it, but as soon as I got there, I had a, it was a safe place to be, and we, um, we were able to, to deal with emotions that had been stuffed for a long time. I didn't feel like I was alone anymore. I was with women who understood uh, what I had been dealing with. And we sorted through truths and lies and things that we had been holding inside for so long. So it, it, it was a tremendous blessing to me, tremendous. Yeah. We're going to start this support group at Calvary Church in your bulletin insert today, there's a note in there. It's, it's called Surrender, Surrendering the Secret. Um, it's an eight-week interactive Bible study that Sue and another uh, lady here at Calvary Church are going to lead. Their phone numbers are there for you to call. Um, it's confidential. 
Um, and, and Sue, the other thing that you said to me is, we're gonna start this in September, but if there's people that need to talk to you before that, if there's somebody that needs to get and, and meet with you one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. as they're dealing, that they can certainly, Absolutely. certainly do this. Yes. Now, it, it was a, a hard step for you to, to mm -hmm. take to, to do this, but it was so freeing. And you yeah. even shared and showed me some of the things you did through the, the support group, and it's just great. Can you just say a word to the person that's sitting out here, maybe the person that's had an abortion and is saying, um, I know I need to do this, but I don't think I have the courage to take, to take this step, to make that phone call. What would you say to them? I would say just surrender it to the Lord and let him lead you, and he will give you what you need to show up, and he will heal you uh, as only he can. Yeah, yeah. Thank you again. I want you to stay right here. We're going to pray in just a moment, but um, we're going to we're going to take some time. I know that this is you know kind of an emotional, heavy type thing, and and for those that have been affected by this or, or can relate to Sue's story, um, you need to process through this a little bit. But for all of us, you know, to be able to think about the way that guilt has impacted our uh, life, uh, let me give you three challenges, and then we're going to give you some time to kind of think this through. Um, first, there are some of you that just need to have the courage to make this phone call, to, to, to call Sue or to call Lynn and say, I, I need this in, in my life. Um, there's others of you that are here and you heard her story of redemption and forgiveness and, and, and what Christ can do and you say, I've heard about Jesus dying on the cross but I've never taken that step personally. Today might be the day that you need to come and to confess and to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ for the very, very first time. But there's others of you that have already taken that step, but you're still dealing with guilt. You can relate to what she said about that box in her heart and the, the guilt and the shame is, is pent up inside there or the pizza dough illustration where the guilt just oozes out and it's affecting so many things in your life and today's the day that you just need to come and you need to confess and you need to repent and we want to give you the opportunity to do that. I'm going to invite the band to come now. Um, Wendy's going to come and she's going to sing a song that relates very much to what we just heard and I just want you to listen. I just want you to hear and then we're going to stand and, and respond and, and, and sing together but uh, as we prepare to do that, let's bow, let's pray together. Father, thank you that you have provided a way for our guilt and our sin and our shame to be dealt with. You sent Jesus to die on the cross and his shed blood covers over our sin. Thank you that that's true of Sue. Thank you that that's true of all of us. Thank you for the, the courage that she had in telling her story and the steps that she's taken to deal with her guilt. And Father, for those that might be sitting here and saying, I need to make that phone call, would you give them the courage to do that? Father, for those that have never placed their faith and trust in you, have never received and accepted that gift of Jesus' forgiveness, of your forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ, may it happen right now in this moment where we just come and, and we confess that we that our sin separates us from you and we repent and we put our faith and our trust in you recognizing that you died for us and for our sin and that we know that there's no amount of good works that can cover over our sin but it's only put in our faith and trust in you. You are the one that sets us free. And so Father, as we now take time and just reflect on this truth and reflect on these words of these songs, would you just do a work in our lives and in our hearts for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. to 
I can be forgiven for my sins and that he covers my guilt and my shame? How can it be that he breaks the chains and that we are free? And it's because of Jesus. It's because of his blood shed on the cross that covers our sin and our guilt and our shame, and it sets us free. That's something to sing about. Let's all rise and let's sing joyfully about the freedom that we have in Christ. Shameful sin 
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who calls me here below will be The gospel is changing lives. It changed Sue's life. It's changed many of your lives. If you're here today and you've put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the very first time, would love to be able to connect with you and follow up with you. And the best way to do that is to take this card that's in the pew rack in front of you, fill it out on the back, check the box that says, I'm beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ. Come, bring it to us at the front. Come and let us pray for you. Meet us in the welcome gathering, whatever uh, way that you can get it to us. would love to be able to connect with you. Others of you, you need to come and see Sue. Some just come and need to give her a hug. Some of you, you need to pick up the phone and give her a call and join that support group uh, over these next uh, days or weeks. And uh, for, for, for all of us, if you need to connect with us at the welcome gathering, if you're here for the first time, would love to be able to do that. Uh, but let's go now with these words. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, and as a result, we can be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Let's continue to make this a safe place, even though it's not always a comfortable place as we pursue life in Christ together. God bless you all. Have a great, great day.